Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the fall webinar of the South Asia section. Uh, my name is Gopi Munisami. I am the chair of the South Asia section for this year, and I'm also a professor at the University of Georgia's Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. And before I get to our distinguished speaker, um, just some housekeeping tips. Uh, the presentation will be for about 40 minutes, and we have reserved 20 minutes for questions. And there are two ways that you can ask questions. One, either unmute, turn your video on, and speak into the um, regular Zoom meeting, or uh, put it in the chat box, and I will share that with the speaker for a response. So that's up to you. Okay, and raise your hand if you want to ask a question, so I can go. I can recognize who need to who need to be in the meeting. Okay, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Prabhu Pingali is a professor in the Charles H. Dyson School of Ag Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. He also has an appointment with the Department of Global Development. He is the founding director of the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition. Prior to joining Cornell, he was deputy director at FAO's Agriculture Development Division. Um, sorry, that was Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, sorry. And prior to that, um, he was director of the Agriculture and Development Economics Division uh, of UN's FAO. And he also has worked at the CGIAR for 15 years from 1987 to 2002, first at Erie in the Philippines, and then with CIMET in Mexico. And Dr. Pingali has several honors, and um, I'm gonna list only three here for want of time. Um, he's a fellow in the, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, a member in the New U.S. National Academy of Sciences and an AEA fellow. He's also the former president of the International Association of Agriculture Economics. Over four decades, he had published 14 books and more than 200 journal articles and chapters on food policy. And his work has been cited over 50,000 times in the academic literature and has influenced national food and agriculture policy and donor funding in several developing countries, including India. Dr. Bengali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gopi. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to give the first of the South Asia webinars. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you can see my screen. Yes. Great. Thank you all. Um, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I want to talk today about um, some of the lessons from South Asia and the lessons around how South Asia managed uh, its fight on hunger and food insecurity. Some of the positive lessons that have come out of this experience uh, over the last uh, uh, 60 years or so and some of the, the negative lessons that have come out, things that we could have done better in the fight for hunger and uh, improving food security in the region. I must say that when we think about South Asia and think about food security in the region, it's really important to say that this was a region that had massive food deficits uh, after independence um, in the 40s and the 50s, 60s, up to the 80s, the region had massive food deficits. It was highly reliant on food aid, PL480 programs from the U.S. and other food aid programs. And there was a, a common perception that South Asia would never be able to feed itself. But Remarkably, uh, by the end of the 1970s and by early 1980s, South Asia became self-sufficient in food and even had surpluses in food. And uh, a region that was destined to be desperately food deficit became a region that uh, is a very important exporter of food, uh, a major exporter of rice and other food products that I'll talk about in a few minutes. 
But I think one of the most amazing things about the region and, and the world in general is what happened to famines. If you look at the history of famines, going back to the 1870s and looking across this period, a century and a half, you see that up until the 1970s, famines were a very common occurrence around the world. Uh, famines in Asia were very, very common and, and devastating. South Asia saw massive famines in the 1940s after independence of, from in India. In the 1970s, the famine in Bangladesh, etc. But if you look at this figure, it shows very clearly that we've actually made famines history now. The world as a whole has seen very little incidence of famines since around the 2000s. Yes, there's hunger, and yes, there's food insecurity, and large number of people still suffer from not having adequate amounts of food, but it's not because of lack of availability of food either at a country level, regional level, or at a global level. Quite often, massive food insecurity and famine-like conditions today are because of civil strife rather than because of uh, agricultural uh, conditions, or, or drought conditions, or uh, adverse conditions that affect agricultural output. So that's been a phenomenal change that's happened in the most recent past. And Asia certainly benefited a lot from that. And, and the data on agriculture productivity um, is very clear. It shows that since about the 1960s, since the start of the so-called Green Revolution, we've seen a dramatic increase in overall yields in Asia and in South Asia. We've seen yields uh, go up by five times in East Asia, primarily because of the rise in yields in China. And we've seen yields in South Asia go up by almost three times. And this is part of the reason why we've seen this dramatic drop in famine-like conditions because of widespread growth in overall agriculture productivity, overall agri uh, food supplies, the drop in food prices, the ability of governments to provide subsidized food to the poorest populations, et cetera, have been some of the, the big dramatic changes that have taken place in the region. And, and this graph shows you that South Asia in, in particular, but globally, we've seen that the rate of growth in yields of the major staple grains have surpassed the growth in population. So over time, you find that yield per, per, per capita availability of grain per capita has kept up with population growth. And, and so rice, wheat, and maize availability per capita has either stayed the same over time or has risen as it's happened in the case of maize where because of hybrid maize, there's been a a fairly sharp increase in availability of maize on a per capita basis. So that's been a big part of the story of the region, that agriculture productivity has more than kept up with population growth rates. And, and if you think about what happened on the import versus export side, up until, uh, and take India, as an example, up until 1990s, India was 
an importer of food, um, gradually declining in terms of imports and having sporadic imports, but still being a, a major importer of, of food, especially rice and wheat. But by the mid 90s, India turned around and became a major exporter of rice. Today, uh, India is the largest rice exporting country and, and has, is above the other historically big exporters, Thailand and Vietnam. Pakistan is also among the top five rice exporting countries uh, in the world. So that's, that change has, was something that nobody would have predicted in the 60s or 70s. Nobody would have imagined that South Asia would become a major exporter of food, let alone being self-sufficient in food. And, and that growth in agriculture productivity, especially growth in smallholder productivity, then kick-started uh, the structural transformation process. It kick-started the process of forward and backward linkages from agriculture into the non-agriculture sector, the growth of uh, goods and services outside of agriculture, the growth of industry, urbanization, the pull of labor out of agriculture into non-agriculture. And, and as all of that happens, the drop in the share of agriculture in GDP and as the overall economy grew, so as, as the overall economy grew, agriculture share dropped, even as the absolute quantity, uh, absolute value of agriculture and GDP kept rising. So that's been the traditional way in which structural transformation has happened around the world. And Asia has not been any exception to that. And South Asia has not been an exception to that. Although there've been periods, uh, regions that are lagging behind within uh, South Asia and even within countries in South Asia, such as Eastern India, the overall process of growth and development has been very clear. And this table actually shows that very, very clearly. If you compare the top 10 countries in the world in 1970, in, in terms of GDP, in 1970 and in 2020, you'll see that in 1970, the only Asian economy that was part of the top 10 was Japan. But by 2020, China became the second largest economy and India became the fourth largest. So again, something that nobody would have imagined happening uh, when they thought about it in the 1970s. And much of this growth happened uh, because of a, a start in massive improvements in agricultural productivity and the structural transformation that followed uh, the agriculture productivity and small farm productivity growth that took place. So when we think about that scenario, we should ask, so what has worked? What are the factors that led to this change uh, that, that we've seen both in terms of uh, reducing hunger, improving food security, and also the, the kickstarting of structural transformation and the movement of South Asian economies into middle income and into emerging economy status. So, so when I think about that, I, I think of the four eyes, the four eyes of the Green Revolution. Uh, first and foremost, I think that the, the way people think about the Green Revolution is 
in terms of the innovations that took place, in, in terms of the new technologies that came in, new technologies especially focused on increasing yields of rice and wheat and maize. So these were the big three staples that the global agriculture research community focused on. And for South Asia, rice and wheat uh, were the big two staples that the region focused on initially. And, and it was not just the global effort, the global efforts that were made through the CGIR systems, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, the International Wheat and Maize Center in Mexico, where the Green Revolution varieties of rice and wheat came out of. But it was also investments in research, investments uh, in adapting these technologies to local conditions that were made by national systems, national programs across the region, uh, the national agriculture research systems in countries like India, Pakistan, et cetera, which took these modern varieties that came out of this international research efforts and, and adapted them to local conditions and then vigorously promoted them across the region with widespread extension systems, uh, support, et cetera. So that brings me to the second of the eyes. The second of the eyes is the infrastructure investments that took place, uh, especially investments in irrigation and road infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's not surprising <clears throat> that the very first areas of the Green Revolution were in the Indian Punjab and the Pakistan Punjab. It's not surprising because those were the areas that already had irrigation infrastructure in place, that already had road infrastructure in place. And so it was natural that uh, a push for increasing productivity and increasing food supplies was focused on these areas which were extremely favorable for intensification and for productivity growth. And it was after that that irrigation infrastructure, road infrastructure spread to other parts of the country and other parts of the South Asian region. And then that gradually led to further increases in productivity. The third eye is institutional reforms. Institutional reforms primarily looking at land rights, uh, tenancy rights, um, land reforms that took place across the region uh, and access to credit, access to information, et cetera, which then allowed small farms to, to benefit from the technology change that was coming in and the wider support that was being provided for enhancing productivity. And then the last I is incentives. So with all of the investments that, were, that happened with the availability of new technology, these were all very important, but if farmers did not have the incentives to increase productivity, they wouldn't have been widespread adoption of these technologies. And, and the incentive systems were very clear, price support programs, input subsidy programs, as well as government procurement programs that provided subsidized food uh, to uh, poorer populations. These programs actually help boost incentives for farmers to adopt these new technologies in areas where it made sense. In, in the more uh, irrigated areas, the better connected areas, areas where intensification had high returns, you found that these incentive systems made a big difference. So it was bringing these four eyes together that made the Green Revolution possible, and it made agriculture productivity growth possible. 
this there's been several examples around the world where bringing them together helped boost agriculture productivity. South Asia is an example, but there have been other examples. If you look at what happened after China liberalized its economy and decollectivized agriculture, you, you saw this big boost in, in overall productivity in China, which happened in the late 80s uh, and then continued on and making China one of the largest economies in the world. Vietnam went through a very similar experience after it went through its process of decollectivizing and giving farmers rights to land and giving farmers rights to decide on what to produce, etc. Vietnam went through the same process for being a, a major importer of food to becoming one of the largest rice exporting countries in the world. So this, this relationship between uh, the in, investments in, in institutional uh, reforms and the incentive systems and their links to productivity growth is, has been established very clearly. And, and I think that these are some of the big lessons that come out of the experience of the last 60 to 70 years. That, the, that any time you want to see productivity improvements, you need to, to make sure that you have the four eyes together. Without that, the, the results could be quite marginal. So that, those are all things that worked. Now, what did not work is also an important issue for us to think about. So what did not work was quite a bit of issues around the types of food that's available, equity issues and environmental issues. It's quite clear that the focus of South Asia on a very narrow set of commodities, very much focused on rice and wheat, led to a narrowing of the food basket in general. And I'll show you data to show that there's been a decline in uh, supplies of traditional staples such as millets, uh, protein-rich uh, foods such as pulses, and, and very little emphasis on vegetables, fruit, livestock products, etc. Much of that's happening now, but in the, the decades after the, the first start of the Green Revolution, these non-staple uh, commodities were, were marginalized in terms of research, in terms of uh, policy support, in terms of extension support, etc. We also find that the record on hunger, poverty reduction, equity has been quite mixed. There's been significant reduction in hunger, but interregional differences persist. And much of the interregional differences are related to productivity differences across regions. And I can show you some data on that. And then the unintended consequences. Most of us are familiar with the environmental consequences, uh, pollution of water systems, overuse of chemicals, loss of biodiversity, etc. But the emerging climate consequences are some of the issues that we need to be looking at as we try to correct the system. So look at uh, this data here shows you for India, the interregional differences. And, and you see that much of the productivity growth for rice was very much more concentrated in the Northwest part of the country, sorry. And, and in the Southern part of the country. And in the case of wheat, much of the productivity growth was focused on the Northwest of India. And so the rest of India, the rest, especially the Eastern and central parts of India did not benefit from the growth in productivity. There are many reasons for that. 
Many of these are dryland areas, rain-fed areas, and the technologies were not suitable for those areas. And there wasn't enough investments made to come up with technologies that are more suitable for these environments. There's been more recent effort, but much of the early effort was very focused on the very favorable environments. And so when you think about poverty and you map poverty, you find poverty incidents also to be very closely associated with areas where productivity was lower. And structural transformation lagged in the regions where productivity was lower. And the ability of these populations to move to employment opportunities outside of their regions was also limited because of limited uh, employment opportunities, because of limited investments that took place in labor intensive industries, et cetera, that could absorb labor out of these lagging regions. So that's been one of the challenges I think that the region has faced. But the other consequence of focusing very narrowly on a few crops is that you find that crops which have um, uh, high protein, high micronutrient content, et cetera, uh, like pulses were crowded out by the movement of the big staples into the system. So if you look at uh, the Indo-Gangetic plain, you find that these areas were very rich in pulses prior to the Green Revolution and they got moved to the more marginal areas after that. And similarly with millets, millets are now seen as the new health food. And, and there you see a revival of millet consumption. But the supply of millets pretty much disappeared across most of the regions in, in India. And it's now very focused in a, a few small pocket areas. And so to bring millets back as a mainstream crop would require a significant effort and significant substitution of crops. And the challenge is that pulses, millets, sorghum, etc., have yields which are quite low. And so from a profitability point of view for small farmers, switching from high yielding crops such as rice and wheat to millets or to pulses uh, tends not to be a profitable option, especially when prices are low. But if it turns out that the demand for these crops is, rises dramatically and the relative prices change, you may see a change there. But we may also see a change through research systems, bringing in higher productivity for these more marginal crops. But that's something one would want to see as we look ahead. So what happened to hunger? So we've seen a significant fall in hunger. As I said, famines are no longer an issue, but calorie deficiency is still an issue. It's changed quite a lot. We've seen a drop in, uh, in the prevalence of hunger, and we've seen a drop in, in the depth of hunger, uh, the extent to which food uh, deficits are below that minimum cutoff level. Uh, but there's still large populations in the region that continue to be hungry. And, and that partly, it's no longer an issue of food availability. It's very much an issue of access and ability to enhance livelihoods of the populations, enhance employment opportunities, et cetera. And that continues to be a challenge in the region. But I think beyond just calorie hunger, there are other big challenges that continue to be there and that haven't been addressed enough. Uh, hidden hunger, the micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies uh, are a major issue. Iron deficiency in particular, vitamin A deficiency are major concerns. 
And, and as a result of micronutrient deficiency, we see anemia levels among women to be high. You see child stunting to be high. And these are major issues uh, from a nutrition point of view that were not dealt with in the early parts of the, the Green Revolution. And the challenge of revitalizing the food system, diversifying the food system to address these issues continues to be a major challenge. But even as you try to address this challenge, obesity levels are becoming a major problem across the region. And I think that's something which we see globally, but we're also seeing it very much in South Asia. And so if you look at the global data, you see that as GDP rises, you do see this drop in, um, in, in the prevalence of hunger and prevalence of undernutrition, but you see the rise in obesity levels happening. And, and that's the same situation that you see in South Asia. If you look at the latest uh, data from the National Family Health Survey that's conducted across India, you see that today the percentage of population that's underweight is almost the same as the percentage of population that's overweight, both for men and for women. And uh, we are making progress on reducing the share of underweight populations, but the share of overweight populations are rising and rising quite dramatically in the region. So, so the, con the issue for us really is how do you address that? And, and in my view, a, a balanced diet, a diverse diet with uh, uh, vegetables, fruit, livestock products, et cetera, can address both the problem of undernutrition and the problem of overnutrition. So many of you are aware that the Eat Lancet came out with a recommended diet, uh, a globally recommended diet um, that helps uh, from a health point of view and also from a sustainability point of view. And you can see the Eat Lancet recommendations on, in their report. What we did in, in my group at Cornell is to say, how does that Eat Lancet diet compare to the current diet of an average uh, Indian? And it turns out that if you look at, for each food group, if you pick up the minimum cost item within a food group, like for staples, what's the minimum cost staple that's in, available in the market? or the minimum cost vegetable that's available in the market and compare it against the actual consumption uh, of an average uh, person, you find that on average uh, in rural India, uh, people consume about uh, uh, food, uh, uh, food consumption is around 60 cents, 60 US cents per day. And if you had to meet the minimum requirement of the Eat Lancet diet, it turns out to be around three and a half dollars per day. So that's a quantum jump from where a population is today in terms of getting to a better diet, a more balanced diet, one that's more nutritious and healthy. And if you look at the the price in terms of average price across each food group, then the average for rural India at, at current consumption levels is around a dollar a day. But if you go with the Eat Lancet recommendation, it becomes around five and a half dollars a day. So the challenge is, how do you get to this diet? How do you get to a more nutritious diet? It would require a significant 
enhancement of, of overall supplies of non-staples, and it would require a significant drop in the relative prices of non-staples to enhance their affordability. And I think that's where we are today, not just in India, but across the region. So, and, and at the same time, trying to deal with the unintended consequences. So it's not just looking at the nutrition side, but also at the sustainability issues. Uh, the challenge of depletion of groundwater systems, uh, decline in soil fertility, um, pollution, uh, all of these issues are major problems that continue to be growing and enhancing productivity long-term is not possible unless you address these sustainability problems today. And one of the reasons why we see these issues is because many of the subsidies and supports that were provided during the Green Revolution encouraged massive intensification and massive use of inputs and the incentives for farmers to, to be more judicious in their input use and smarter in their input use was limited. As long as water was free or electricity was free and fertilizers were highly subsidized, et cetera. And unless these incentive systems are changed, we will not see this transition happening towards a more sustainable production system. The other big challenge as we look ahead is what's happening in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the energy use in agriculture. With increased energy use, greenhouse gas emissions tend to rise quite a bit. Uh, and globally, agriculture accounts for around 15 to 20% of total greenhouse gas emissions. In the case of South Asia, the number is probably closer to 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Rice and livestock account for a large share of that. And so identifying ways in which one can enhance productivity while at the same time not increasing greenhouse gas emissions is a big challenge I think the region is facing as we look ahead. And one of the issues that I mentioned already about the diversity of diets, but the food basket being very narrow. And, and you can see that when you look at the prices, when you look at prices across um, commodities, you see that non-staples, vegetables, fruit, pulses, meat and milk, have seen much sharper price increases over time, but much greater and also greater volatility in prices over time. And that has affected the ability of consumers to switch to a more balanced diet. And, and one of the reasons we see this volatility is that the infrastructure investments, the value chain investments, et cetera, for perishable products haven't kept up with the demand. And government policy hasn't particularly moved from a focus on staples to a focus on enhancing the diversity of the food system. And that's a challenge that as we look forward, uh, we need to be facing in the region. We need to be looking at how do you shift the focus from quantity, which has been pretty much the food policy focus over decades, to a focus on food quality, diversity, affordability, and sustainability? That's the challenge I think the region is facing. And, and the current policy uh, within the region, food policy, agriculture policy, continues to be very much a green revolution oriented policy. The stickiness of green revolution policies continue to be 
uh, hampering any ability to move to a more diversified and a sustainable food system. And the political economy of changing these policies has been a major bottleneck in trying to get to a, a more diversified food systems. So this is my last slide. So where do we go from here? So there are lots of policy lessons that have come out from looking at the Green Revolution experience, looking at the productivity growth that's taken place. But as we look forward, we need to be looking at shifting our focus from just calorie hunger to micronutrient malnutrition and the overnutrition issues and looking at how do you get there by moving from a staple grain focus to a broader diversity of the food system. And in order to do that, we need massive investments in markets, in value chains, in connecting smallholders to value chains, et cetera, and, and providing incentives for being smarter and more efficient in farming. And that way, reducing some of the environmental impacts that happen. We also need to be looking at our safety net programs, especially food-based safety net programs, and looking at making them more diversified, more nutrition sensitive, rather than just be focused on staples. And we need ways in which productivity goals hunger goals, health and nutrition goals are all looked at together. And that would require convergence of policies across ministries rather than looking at policies sector by sector. Um, one of the lessons we've learned is that women's empowerment is really crucial as we look ahead. More empowered women tend to have better nutrition outcomes for themselves and for their households. And there's lots of good studies and data from my team here, but several other groups around uh, for South Asia. Um, in addition to that, investments beyond agriculture in water, hygiene, overall health, et cetera, uh, are really important if you want to get to better health outcomes and nutrition outcomes. And finally, consumer behavior change is really important also. Consumer behavior change moving from a very staple grain and high energy, high carb uh, diets to uh, a more balanced diet, a diet that uh, emphasizes perishable food, especially vegetables, fruit, livestock products, et cetera. That allows you to reduce uh, undernutrition and malnutrition, but also arrest the rise in obesity levels. So let me stop here and I'm happy to take any questions that may come up. Thank you, Prabhu. That's just a fantastic presentation laying out um, what has worked and what has not worked in the context of South Asia. I really appreciated the comprehensive view you provided. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are now open for questions. And you have two ways of asking questions. Unmute, turn on your video and speak into it. Um, or you can type it in the chat, then I'll share it with the speaker. While we wait for questions to come in, Prabhu, let me ask you the first question. Um, sure. I think what not to do really kind of st stuck with me. The three broad pointers you had there about the food basket has become narrower. The evidence on hunger is mixed, particularly we don't have, we may be having fewer undernourished people, but we have people who have other problems. Uh, micronutrient deficiency, obesity, and so on, and then the climate and environmental consequences that you talked about. I'm going to pause here because you told me <laughs> it might freeze. Um, yeah, it did. Okay. Maybe you have to 
the last part of your question. Yeah, the, the third bullet that you had there was about um, climate and environmental consequences. Okay. And then at the last slide, you went through the various policy options that we need to think about, right? Right. Um, somebody in New Delhi would want to know how do you rank them? Which one should we go after first? Because you know we can talk about many policies and their resources are limited. The human capital to address that is limited in, in either Dhaka or Islamabad or, or in a New Delhi and so on. So they're going to ask you the question of where do I go? Where do I get the most bang for my buck kind of story? Right. So if you were to rank some of these efforts that we need to undertake, to make this this hunger resolution more comprehensive, um, where do you where should we start? I think number one policy change that's needed, and probably the most difficult one, is to go to uh, what I call a crop neutral agriculture policy. So an agriculture policy that provides you know, all of the eyes that I listed out, but one that does not say, focus on one particular crop. So you're trying to remove the crop specificity of, an agri of current agriculture policies. That way you're, you're providing overall support for farmers, but the choice of crops becomes a market signal issue rather than a government signal issue. Uh, but to get there is politically very challenging because the people who benefited the most from the government supports are the ones who will lose out the most and they'll be the ones who'll be out there uh, agitating against that change. Thank so, you. Thank that's you. The challenge. Uh, we have some a number of questions here. I'm going to go with my wish first. My wish, please unmute and... Uh... And, yeah. and please Thank ask you. the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prabhu, for that very good overview of what to what to do and not to do. Um, I I was waiting for your um, last bullet of the last slide, um, and was thinking when are you going to bring that up? And I'm I was glad to see at least it was there on the last slide and last uh, bullet. So to me, you know, we have grown up. Uh, I mean, because of the bias towards cereal crops like rice and wheat um, in terms of those four eyes you mentioned in South Asia, uh, generation, at least two, three generations of people have now grown up with a, with a taste for those two commodities, correct? I mean, the diets are full of products uh, that are made of wheat and rice. And nobody has even maybe tasted <laughs> millets and sorghums and uh, very traditional food that was eaten uh, by our, um, you know, just two, three generations ago by our forefathers. Uh, so how do you, you know, um, change, uh, uh, you know, create demand for such products uh, to me is a major challenge uh, where generations have now been growing up without tasting those products and uh, may not even associate that with the taste. So, you know, people are consumers are taste sensitive as well as price sensitive. Right. And how do you balance that with this goal of uh, reducing hidden hunger or malnutrition? I just would like your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, in, in urban India, at least I see some change happening, at least some more awareness that, that you need to be consuming more of the non-rice staples. So there's some inkling of rising demand for millet millets that's happening. But on the vegetables and fruit side, I think the demand is rising quite a bit. Uh, I always think about uh, the example of quinoa. Quinoa came out of nowhere. I mean, even in around 1990, no one heard of quinoa. And now so quinoa is sort of part of the regular diet in the US and in Europe. 
and that happened one because there was a highly nutritious product, but then the private sector got involved and really promoted it. And I think that's where we want to be in South Asia. Some of that behavior change is going to come through private sector investments in advertising and in campaigning, et cetera. And you see a little bit of that, but there's a long way to go. Uh, but for the, the poorest populations, I would go with the current uh, public distribution system and look at how do you expand the public distribution system to include course, course cereals in there and pulses. And that way you're, you're, you're creating a change both at the top end of the income spectrum, but also at the, the lower end of the spectrum for change. But this is an active discussion and something that many of us are thinking about. And I know you at my wish have been thinking a lot about this too. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. You mentioned about quinoa, and I think a major push came when it was declared as the International Year of Quinoa by the yeah. food and agriculture. And hopefully, you know, this year is the International yeah. Year of Millets. Millets Maybe yeah. it gives right. the similar uh, push uh, to the popular, you know, popularity of millets and its increased consumption. I hope so. Thank I you so much. So. Thanks. Yeah. We next have uh, Kedar Vishnu. Yeah. Uh... Uh, yeah, are you able to hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, this is uh, Kedar from Isaac, now with NMRMS. So I wanted to ask two questions. First question, uh, how we can connect the small and marginal farmers, uh, particularly when we have withdrawn the three-firm law in India, uh, because uh, we want to promote the commercial agriculture, but uh, there is a huge fluctuation in prices. That's what we can see from the presentation. So how we can overcome this problem, number one question. And number two question, uh, um, I, I strongly feel we lack in an institutional mechanism. Though we have implemented those three from law or contract farming, but in India, I feel uh, uh, we still law, lack in an institutional mechanism for connecting them. So how we can overcome that problem? Uh, what kind of lesson we can learn from any other countries to overcome this problem? Thank you. I think, um, I think what uh, is happening now with promoting farmer producer organizations and helping connect farmer producer organizations to uh, value chains uh, urban food value chains, I think, is a really promising way to go. Um, I think some of the laws of liberalizing the marketing and all that uh, may have been paused, but I suspect that they'll come back in again at some point. But the basic infrastructure around how do you create aggregation of small farms, not to physically bring them together, but rather as a producer group where they can have scale in, in marketing and scale in being able to bargain for better prices and all of that is really important. And I think India is moving in that direction, but um, there's still a long way to go. You find that it's more successful in the, in the high value crops, like uh, vegetables, et cetera, but not so much across the board. I think that's my risk. Um, and next, ne yeah, next we have Abdullah Jahanzeb. Um, hi, sir. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. I'm Abdullah from Pakistan, and I'm here at the Global Development Department at Cornell. My question is about smallholder farmers. So my research in Pakistan tells that the, one of the biggest problems for farmers, my research with smallholder farmers, is the lack of access to finance for them. And that basically disincentivizes the, the adoption of climate smart practices. So how would you suggest that we can increase finance in a way that incentivizes practices that contribute towards climate efficiencies? Because there's an inherent dis disadvantage and disincentive within the system towards climate smart practices for smallholder farmers. Yeah, that's a tough question. 
uh, it's tough because when you go think about climate smart, many of the climate smart uh, practices are practices which are also smart agriculture practices. You don't have to be climate smart. You, if you're smart in agriculture, you could also be climate smart. For example, being more efficient in fertilizer use, where reduces nitrous oxide emission. Uh, being reducing tillage uh, incorporates crop residues, um, etc. So one can be much smarter in what they're doing today, but that requires finances. Uh, in terms of some technology adoption and and some of the efforts that are going on on when agriculture financing microcredit systems etc have been helpful in this regard but i think that's where the government needs to step up a lot more so if you remove some of the price subsidies fertilizer subsidies and move it more towards getting credit subsidies then I think that balance could change. But it's a big issue and I didn't know you're just downstairs from me, so you can happy for you to pop up and chat with me. Thank you, thank you so much. And next we have Yunli, bye. Yeah, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you Professor Pingali at Gopi. I'm really like this presentation particularly on the women empowerment and the crop diversity. Uh, I'm from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences and also senior research fellow at UNEP IMP, a collaborative center between UNEP and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, focusing on the nexus approaches or climate change adaptation, ecosystem restoration and the livelihood improvements uh, recently, uh, uh, we used the data we collected in Nepal, Cambodia, and uh, uh, other two uh, Southeast Asian countries to study the relationship on women's uh, decision-making or crop choice uh, on their uh, household dietary diversity. Yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, uh, the conclusion is uh, uh, in live with uh, Professor Pagali. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, except for the government's uh, focus, uh, is there any other factors to uh, discourage farmers to um, plant uh, non stable uh, crops? Uh, because, uh, for example, the technology of planting uh, stable crops is very different from planting. Uh, vegetables or other uh, crops. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Um, on women's empowerment, there's a lot of work on India and uh, a lot of that is on our website. So you can take a look and compare against your work for Nepal and other countries also. On, on the non-perishable crops, I think uh, you're absolutely right learning the new technologies, learning new management practices, learning how to deal with the market. All these are new skills. It's yes. easier to grow rice and wheat. There's an established system, you go into that. The price fluctuations for perishable is also important. Quality standards are very important. So mm -hmm. overall transactions costs of farmers in growing perishable products are much higher than for staples. And the risks are much higher. Mm -hmm. And and therefore, I think farmers individually tend to hesitate to, to make the switch. But if you create a scale uh, through various aggregation models, contracting a village or contracting a producer group, et cetera, then I think some of those transactions costs can be reduced. And when you have scale, then the private sector also has an incentive to, to deal with you and invest in you uh, rather than invest in individual farmers, especially when they're small farms. Okay. So that's an issue that's very important. We have a, a paper on looking at farmer producer organizations also on our website. 
So that may give you some more information on that. Okay, thank you. Vikas, I think. Prabhu, can you take one more question? Yeah, I think just one more and then okay. we wrap. Vikas, Vikas, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Pengali. Uh, my name is Vikas Mishra and I'm doing my PhD from Texas a &M. So my focus of research is on food policy and diet qualities. So like what I uh, like what I have learned is like obesity in developed countries and developing countries are quite different. And there are lessons learned from developed countries how this obesity thing is going up and it's not because of excess. It's not because you cannot afford it. But in terms of uh, developing countries like in India, the obesity is totally different. So how should we think as a researcher to pinpoint the reasons and what area of focus of research should be if we want to control that pandemic of obesity? So when you say different, I'm not sure in what so, way. So in the way like uh, in US, it's the the access is not a big problem. The food access is not a big problem. There are food assistance program. They provide enough money to right. have a good diet. But if you go back to India, you don't have access. Still, your obesity thing is going up. Yeah. So it's it's type of contrast. You have access, still you are obese. You don't have access, still you are obese. So so yeah, I get that. So in, in, if you think about the US the highest incidence of obesity is among the poorest populations, right? Because they're the ones who are eating uh, highly processed foods, which tend to be very cheap and sugary beverages, et cetera. Now, if you think about India, uh, you find obesity levels rising in rural and in urban populations and across all income spectrums, uh, not the poorest income spectrum, but middle and upper, but rural and urban. And the reason for what's happening is fat consumption is rising. Uh, oil, vegetable oil, fat, and sugar consumption through sweets, etc., And rice consumption, giving you high levels of carbs. And so that's where your obesity issues are coming from. It's not coming from high processed food consumption as you see in the US. But the, the ratio of fat to uh, vegetables uh, is very, very high levels of fat compared to other more nutritious foods. So I have one of my papers actually breaks this down. But we also have a, a paper which looks at obesity across the country spatially and, and maps out obesity levels in different parts of India. And yes, a larger share of obesity is in the Northeast and Northwest and South, but rising in other parts of the country also. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Kup. Thank you. Prabhu, Prabhu, thank you very much for a, um, a great presentation and, uh, and the question and answer session was even better. So thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, make it a great success. The first one of uh, the webinar series of the South Asia section. We anticipate having more, and I see Aditya, who's the chair elect, coming into the section. Um, so we anticipate continuing this tradition for every semester. So stay tuned for the next one. And thanks again, Prabhu, and, and all the sure. participants. Thanks. Bye.